Okay. Okay. So, uh, Macbeth. Yes, as we said, uh, we just had a uh, beginning to uh, an introduction to Macbeth. Uh, hope you remember Hawkeye, uh, like Hamlet, Othello, King Lear, and Macbeth. This is how it goes. And Macbeth uh, performed in 1606. Okay, the play got performed in 1606. Uh, Randy, please uh, turn off your microphone. Yes, ma'am, my phone got some issues. Ah, okay, okay, no problem. Take your time and uh, just uh, turn it off, no problem. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So this is the last of the tragedies and the style is completely formed. We have already discussed that when he was writing this, uh, uh, what to say, great tragedies, by that time itself, you know, everything was uh, fixed, almost, uh, you know, uh, the... the um, style, uh, the structure, the form, everything was on, uh, you know, uh, space. Uh, but coming to Macbeth, it was at its peak. Everything was fixed, completely formed, okay? And uh, the sources are uh, written here. You can uh, have a look on that. First of all, uh, George Buchanan's Latin History of Scotland <coughs> and also Hollinshed's Chronicles of England, Scotland and Ireland. Then... Um, uh, Reginald Scott's discovery of witchcraft, then King James First's uh, demonology. Okay, these are considered to be the sources of Macbeth. Uh, like Shakespeare got inspired by certain points from all these works, and finally he wrote the uh, final product is Macbeth. And then Thomas Middleton is believed to have, I think we have discussed this, Middleton is believed to have adapted and abridged the original play uh, written by Shakespeare. So now what we are reading is considered to be an abridged version of Thomas Middleton. We don't know exactly. Okay, so uh, let's just uh, discuss, you know the plot, I guess, so I don't think it is necessary to um, give a very detailed uh, expansion of this map, but I'll just tell you, like, Scotland is, uh, this is ha happening in Scotland, and Scotland is stormed by rebellion, so many rebellions are on. And uh, actually, these rebellions are uh, resisted by King Duncan's two generals. They are uh, Macbeth as well as uh, Banco. <coughs> Macbeth is the pain of uh, Glamis. Okay, at that time, in the beginning of the play, Macbeth is, this is something very important. If you get some uh, questions from uh, within the text, uh, you know, uh, who was Macbeth at the beginning of the play? Then the middle of the play, then at the end of the play, likewise, the, the um, uh, dignity or the position of Macbeth keeps changing. So, uh, Thane means, I, I told it in the last class, I guess, <coughs> it's a military noble position. By birth, he is not a nobleman. He is not of the aristocracy category. But uh, with his military uh, power or the military status, he is considered to be a nobleman, military nobleman. That is what called Thane, T-H-A-N-E, Thane. So he is the Thane of Glamis. Uh, and Banco is also there, and on their way, and they uh, defeated some uh, rebe uh, rebellions, and they were on on the way back to King Duncan, and they are meeting three witches, the very important part in Macbeth, three witches, and there starts everything. And the three witches, and they are making a prophecy that uh, Macbeth will become the Thane of Cowder. And now he is the Thane of Glamour, Glamis. And they are saying uh, he will soon become the Thane of Cowder. That is a higher position, of course. And they are also saying, like, he'll become the King of Scotland, too. Okay. And, uh, and they are also saying, like, Banco's sons will be the kings. Not Banco, but his sons will be the kings. These are the three <coughs> prophecies made by the uh, witches. And these people are very curious to know uh, what about what is next, what is next, things like that. But they are not ready to give any further information. These, these three witches are just disappearing. And uh, they are reaching uh, uh, Jenkins court and soon after reaching there, Hamlet learns that now he got promoted as 
the pain of cow dung. Now he is shocked. Oh my God, this is what the witches also said. So that is correct. So what is the next prophecy by the witches? He will be the king of Scotland. So will that happen? How can it be happen? Because the king is alive, he is here, then uh, how can it be possible? He is confused. And King Duncan said he is making a visit to Macbeth's castle that night itself. And Macbeth is now, uh, uh, you know, with his wife, Lady Macbeth, very prominent figure, lady, I mean, a female uh, characters uh, done by uh, William Shakespeare. And he's telling about this prophecy. And the first part of the prophecy, first prophecy is now, okay, fulfilled, completed. And then this lady is also very ambitious, okay, over ambitious, actually, greedy, actually. And she's insisting his, uh, her uh, husband to kill the king so that you will be the king of Scotland. And uh, Macbeth is also now, you know, shade, okay, they said like this, and now one part is okay. So, uh, likewise, it goes and... Uh, uh, you know, finally, king comes to their uh, castle and they are killing the king. Okay, they planned and uh, they killed the king. But even before killing and even after killing, uh, Macbeth is totally confused. He couldn't resist the uh, ambivalence uh, that he had. He's full of confusion. So the suspicion falls on Duncan's sons, the king's sons that are Malcolm as well as John Albay. And they actually flee from Scotland. Why they flew from uh, Scotland is because they are now very uh, afraid. Uh, will we be also uh, killed by the people, the unknown, uh, uh, you know, enemies? That is what made them flee from uh, Scotland. But people, especially Macbeth and everyone, made everyone believed that these people are uh, probably the culprits. And Macbeth is now the king. But he feels insecure. He cannot enjoy the uh, uh, the, the the fortune. Uh, actually, that is not a fortune. This is something he grabbed from someone. But still, he's uh, though he is enjoying all these things, he cannot uh, experience the enjoyment. And then Macbeth sends murderers. Still, he is confused because there is another prophecy that Banquo's sons will also be kings. So he is thinking like if, if something is not gained by our own uh, effort, our own hard work or our own luck, we'll be confused. If, if we grab something from others, definitely <coughs> we'll be like, will this survive? And we'll be doing more and more <coughs> bad things, more and more mistakes to sustain that so Macbeth is also doing the same Macbeth sent murderers to kill Bango and his sons but sons escape Bango only got killed then Macbeth is weighed down by the guilt sleeplessness uh, but and, and he again meets the witches but the witches assure him that he will not be defeated until Burnham Wood comes to dance in this place Burnham Wood is a nearby forest, a local forest. Okay, it's full of woods, full of trees. And that woods, that forest should come to this place. That is one thing. And also the other thing is like no man born um, of a woman can harm him. Okay, no man born out of a woman can uh, harm him. Macbeth. These are the two assurance given by the witches. So now Macbeth is kind of, okay, fine. Uh, even if the uh, Burnham woods come to this place, this is not happened because every man, every people, every human being will come out of a woman only, born out of a woman only. So this is what he's thought. So uh, Macduff is another character. He's, a, uh, he's the powerful Thane of Fifi. He's another Thane, that is military nobleman. And he joins Malcolm, Malcolm in England. Malcolm is the son of Duncan who uh, flee from, uh, who got flee from uh, Scotland. So he's now in England and this Magda, Magduff is finding out this person and they are joining and they're saying like something is happening. Ma Macbeth has done something, so we have to take revenge on him. So they are like united. Okay, so uh, what happens? Macbeth again, he wants to sustain, he wants to retain his throne, right? So he is like, uh, again, he slaughters Macduff's family. Okay, Macduff's family. 
then by this time both macbeth as well as lady macbeth are totally you know down with this guilt feeling and all those things and this distraught lady macbeth wants that is the very famous sleep walking scenes in um, macbeth because she cannot sleep and she is smelling her hand because she was the one who uh, hid the dagger with which uh macbeth killed duncan so she feels like still her uh, uh, palms are stained with the blood of duncan and even if she washes it for may, many many times she is not satisfied she can still uh, smell it uh, so that's why she uh, says like the whole perfumes of arabia cannot even this is just paraphrasing but this is how she says the uh, whole perfumes of Ar arabia cannot uh, you know <clears throat> had this smell this blood smell that is actually symbolically the smell of the crime that that they, that they have committed so she is with this and one of her sleepwalking scenes she is actually revealing this particular thing to her doctor and some other people she is just blabbering okay uh, she is not conscious and she is just blabbering and others came to know about the deed done by macbeth as well as lady macbeth and then uh, what is by this time malcolm Dun duncan's son with the help of macduff uh, they uh, soldiers cut the branches and now they, they all got slaughtered malcolm with his soldiers they cut the branches of this burnham wood okay to camouflage uh, their attack uh, they are they, they want to hide themselves it is a sudden secret attack so for which they just cut the woods off, the branches off or the trees from this burnham wood and they uh, with that they were moving. So actually the wood was, the forest was moving towards Scotland or moving towards Macbeth. So the first uh, thing is now over. Now the first assurance given by the... <clears throat> Uh, the three witches that is over now and the second thing is like Macbeth is also um, get by this time Macbeth is also getting a word, word that Lady Macbeth is dead okay and then uh, then these people came in a camouflaged way and finally Macbeth is killed by Macduff and he was wondering the witches told me that no man born out of a woman cannot kill me then how this macduff can kill me that is what his um, uh, his thought actually macduff during uh, his birth <clears throat> He was actually ripped out of the wound of his mother. That means kind of a caesarean uh, birth that we are having now. But during that time, that was not a normal birth. That was not born out of a woman. Okay, that is something. Uh, born out of a woman means a natural, a normal delivery. And he was not a kid like that. He, he When his uh, birth happened, actually his mother died and they all uh, ripped the baby out of the mother's womb so we cannot say like he is born out of a woman born is during that time considered to be a normal delivery so macbeth comes to know about this fact and now both the assurance are over now the burnham woods uh, the forest is here as well as this person is not actually born out of a woman so ultimately macbeth dies and malcolm is now the king of scotland <clears throat> this is what the uh, content of um, Macbeth and uh, most of the time we know the structure. Why I gave you at least uh, this kind of an information of all the four um, plots of great tragedies is because you should be very careful about the minute details. Okay, again you have to read. This is not actually enough. Again you have to read the at least the detailed summary. If you cannot read the original text, at least you should read the detailed summary of all these plays because uh, these are something. These four plays are very important in the context of British literature, especially drama, uh, when it comes to this kind of uh, examinations and all. That's why. That's a, that is what our ultimate preference is, right? That's why. See, now let's see the features of uh, this particular play, okay? Uh, and we can say that compared to the other uh, three tragedies, okay, this one is uh, in this particular play, action progresses at a very fast pace. 
in king lear in hamlet in not the low we can see like okay some kind of lagging uh, uh, at times it lags like this and that and uh, uh, procrastination in Hamlet, procrastination is there. And uh, in the case of uh, King Lear also, the king is like wandering here and there. So, so some slow pace is there. But here the action progresses at a fast pace comparing to the other drama, dramas. And then uh, you can say in its language in action, the play is full of violence and storm. It's full of violence from the beginning Till the end, it is full of violence. And that is also a different uh, feature comparing to the other dramas. In other dramas, we can say like, of course, violence is there, but violence comes at a particular point. Not uh, all the time. But in the case of Macbeth, from the beginning, it starts with the rebellion defeated by uh, the generals. <coughs> and then till the end, till the death of Macbeth, it goes in that way. And you can see darkness brood over the uh, tragedy. Darkness broods. Because uh, uh, most of the scenes in Macbeth is set in the night time. And that is why in ba Macbeth, uh, when uh, I, I don't know whether you have listened to the previous um, uh, classes of mine. Uh, and when we were discussing the Elizabethan theater and the structure, uh, I told you that in um, most of the plays, there are so many descriptions or soliloquies or dialogues on the seasons and the time. Because the stage setting was like that, there was no only the, the plays were performed only at the daytime. Okay, so they don't have any other option to convince the audience that this happens during winter or this happens at the night or this happens at this particular time. They don't have any provision. So the only provision, the only thing they uh, could do is like giving uh, a, a <clears throat> verbal description of the time period and in Macbeth you can see like more than 40 uh, such explanations of the time uh, of the lighting of the structure of the ambience or something like that and that's because most of the scenes are set in darkness that means at night for example the witches the witches are visiting these people that happens at night and the wish of the dagger with which they kill Duncan and the murder of Duncan happens at night. The murder of Banco happens at night. The sleepwalking scenes of Lady Macbeth that happens at night. Um, so <coughs> all these are night scenes, and you cannot see these much of night scenes in any other place of Shakespeare. I mean, the great tragedies of Shakespeare. Any other place you can say like that. So this darkness broods over the tragedy. And um, this darkness is relieved by occasional flashes of color and uh, light. Actually, there are no much, uh, uh, you know, this kind of scenes, daylight uh, scenes. And that's why there are more than 40 such explanations or descriptions or soliloquies or monologues about the time uh, and the season of the, sorry, uh, season of the, uh, period, particular period. And the depiction of evil, okay, depiction of evil, actually, uh, study of a human potential for evil. How much potential a human being has for evil and how a human being can, uh, uh, can be tempted Okay, towards evil. These kinds of ideas are very much depicted in Macbeth. Actually, Macbeth is a representation of all human beings. Uh, when you get such a, uh, an offer that you will be like this, you will be like that, uh, how people go for indirect ways to uh, achieve or attain that particular position. That is a psychological shade uh, that is hidden in all the human beings and that is depicted in man. But actually that is the relevance of these plays even during this time. And the triumph of evil in a man of many good qualities Maybe actually Macbeth is a nobleman. We know uh, the, the uh, tragedy and the tragic hero, how a tragic hero should be. He should be a nobleman and um, uh, he should be a person who, who, who attracts the attention of the people. Then only the people feel this kind of pity and fear towards the downfall of that hero. So Macbeth is also a very nice man, a gentleman who is having lots and lots of good qualities. 
But because of the political ambition, because of the influence of Lady Macbeth, and because of the instigation of supernatural power, first of all, he got tempted by the witches and their prophecy got corrected. Uh, for example, if someone is some astrologer or someone says you that, okay, tomorrow you will be like that, you will get a rank or something like this. Okay, Def definitely we will believe on that supernatural power without, uh, you know, having much authenticity. Then influence of Lady Macbeth and political ambition. These are the uh, three reasons with which the evil god triumphed or a man of good qualities. And then depiction of evil in the play has two aspects. One is like the natural or human aspect. That is Macbeth, the man himself. In the man, uh, there are some political ambition is there. Macbeth is a person who wants to achieve um, uh, heights. So something like that. Second aspect is like, of course, supernatural. And that is the witches, the omens and all these things um, instigate him to do this kind of things and, uh, uh, you know, tempt him in a bad way. Now let us just discuss the character of Macbeth as well as Lady Macbeth because these are the two prominent figures in uh, this particular play. So we can attribute <coughs> three major attributes that we can uh, have on uh, Macbeth is, uh, once again, I'm clear, I guess, because it shows like your internet connection is unstable. If if it is breaking or something like that, please do uh, tell me or give me a message in the chat box. Okay. Yeah. First of all, bravery. He's a very brave man. And second, he is a man of ambition and he is a man of self-doubt. He is confused. Even when he was there in front of Duncan to kill him, at that time itself, he was confused. Should I do this or not? Because he was not completely into that. And even after that, okay, anyway, I have done this. Now let it be. It's not like that he is again confused. The self-doubt and everything was there. But, but at the same time, he is very ambitious. He is very ambitious. <coughs> he wants to achieve the heights, whatever the uh, uh, consequences be, he wants to. Okay, so these are the three. This is a actually very weird combination and that actually led to his downfall. And uh, you can see the weakness of a self-doubt is what prevents Macbeth from becoming a villain like Iago and Edmund. Because Iago and Edmund are two characters. Hope you remember Iago from Othello and Edmund from King, King Lear. They are like pucka villains. We don't feel any kind of sympathy or empathy or oh, how sad it is. We don't feel anything like that towards these two characters, that is Iago and Edmund. But definitely, though Macbeth has done this kind of a series of mistakes, still... Uh, you know, uh, some kind of an, an element of empathy or why he did like that. That kind of a feeling uh, is there, can be aroused in, in the audience. And that is because of this self-doubt. Okay, the self-doubt is what prevents Macbeth from becoming a villain. Because even when he was doing something, he is confused whether I should do, whether this is ethical, but at the same time, he is over ambitious. Uh, he, he couldn't uh, stop it, things like that. And before he kills uh, Duncan, uh, when you make a character analysis of Macbeth, this is something very important. Why Macbeth is not a villain? That is something important. Not a, uh, you know, exclusively he is not a villain. That is because of this. And then before he kills uh, Duncan, Macbeth is, Macbeth is plagued by worry. Ma'am, yeah. so self-doubt is the quality that prevents Macbeth by... Uh, like Actually, it we cannot say. Ah, no, no, no. We cannot say it's a quality. It's not at all a quality. But sometimes Macbeth is confused. So some kind of ethical elements are also there in uh, uh, Macbeth. That is why he got the self doubt. Should I do this? Uh, will this be fine? Okay, something like that. But ultimately, the evil side. Uh, that is what. Uh, uh, <coughs> wins over the other ethical side of this person. And because of the self-doubt, Hamlet is, sorry, Macbeth is not considered to be a pakka villain. 
okay that is what the thing we cannot say self doubt is a quality but why the self doubt comes to macbeth because he has some good qualities inside his mind when edmund was doing all those things against his father and other people he didn't have this kind of a doubt because he was exclusively a villain other side was not there when iago was doing something against uh, uh, desdemona as well as othello he didn't have this doubt he was exclusively doing that but when macbeth though he is doing something uh, Uh, uh something considered to be mistake or something against his ethical values still he is confused like should i do this should i do that and that makes him uh, makes the audience prevent from considering macbeth to be a akka villain that's it okay oh okay. okay. so then <clears throat> then uh before uh, he kills duncan this is what something very important because he he is um, um, what to say longing to become the king of scotland and he is influenced by lady macbeth and influenced by the political ambition and he is there in front of duncan with his dagger and uh, when he was stabbing duncan at that time also he was worried he was plagued by worry okay he was that intensely worried a, a pakka villain will not be like that okay that makes the difference between a macbeth and the uh, original or the usual conventional villains and then after the mur murder also he is increasingly alone so before the mur murder during the murder after the murder all the time he was confused he was uh, feeling lonely he was feeling uh, very uh, you know uh guilty and uh, things like that so he was fluctuating between the fits of feverish actions uh and moment of terrible guilt and pessimism this is what happened he was he was undergoing a very critical situation for a man just imagine a man is experiencing this kind of a thing the, the, the person has to do something and the person is doing that but after that time the person is not feeling comfortable with what he is uh, what he has done uh, so that is kind of a very psychological stressful situation and this is what hamlet is undergoing and that's why he is a very complicated character still he uh, he can uh, pour down this pity and fear on the a people because this is something uh, uh, can be connected to the people if it is edmund no one can no i cannot connect with edmund because i am not like that we can say like that but uh, a macbeth is not like that sometimes this can happen for me also this kind of a feeling can be imparted to the audience that is what the significance of the character macbeth and then uh, coming to the character lady macbeth actually this is one of shakespeare's most frightening female characters you can say most frightening female characters because we'll be thinking like what kind of a lady is this okay uh, things like that see uh, she's very stronger ruthless and more ambitious than her husband of course she's more ambitious than her husband because um, macbeth was just conveying this message okay the witch just told me like this and this is how it happened and soon after i met duncan i got promoted so the one part is over now what with then this lady actually insisted her husband to do the thing actually he got influenced by lady macbeth to a great extent and uh, you know she relates power ambition and violence to masculinity this is something a very stereotypical thing even now we are having like we are imposing or associating power ambition violence so if you are a man you should do some violent activities you should prove your bravery uh, or um, you can attain things only by the means of this kinds of this kinds of means then only you will be achieving something in your, that, that's how she is like created a stereotypical version of masculinity and uh, she was uh, actually injecting this kind of an insecurity uh, on a macbeth so she she she, she, she won finally and she uses this female method of manipulation to uh, achieve power uh, that is like we usually say like oh after his marriage he is full of uh, he gives his complete years to his wife and she has that uh, uh, nature of or that um, uh, what to say that uh, 
uh, ability of or that skill of controlling or manipulating her husband in a way that is what called this female method of manipulation uh, that is something got deconstructed and criticized in the later period but still she uses this female method like how a wife can manipulate her husband in all the way in all those ways she is manipulating even then macbeth is no we should not do like that then she was insisting him no you should do like that things like that okay then lady macbeth presents the <coughs> weakness of humanity in the face of evil we cannot say that okay she is an exclusive uh, 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 villainous character or something uh, like that but she is she represents as i said earlier she represents the evil part or the evil shade hidden in all human beings hidden in all human beings and uh, she see, see here you can see she avoids mentioning the murder too explicitly okay uh, and she cannot do the deed herself she wants her husband to do that and then falls into an anguished madness and a uh, disrupted sleep she after this she is also like highly frustrated and finally she commits suicide so this is like uh, the, the the evil part in a human being <coughs> she never mentions the murder explicitly okay she says some some other words or some some other terms for that and uh, she cannot do that deed herself she wants someone else to do that she wants her husband to be the king of scotland she wants to enjoy <coughs> all the advantages of that but at the same time she doesn't want to directly involve in that and falls into an anguished madness and uh, disrupted because her husband is also not that comfortable both of them they couldn't enjoy uh, what they aspired okay and finally she is committing suicide so a very complicated but at the same time very strong very powerful uh, lady character or a female character by uh, william uh, shakespeare okay so that is what all about the uh, uh, the the major poems of all these uh, four uh, tragedies that is uh, hamlet or the looking lear and macbeth and this will uh, this, the, this particular session will end in a minute and we will uh, come back again okay use the same link and uh, uh, join we will discuss the roman plays <coughs> shakespeare's <coughs> roman plays can be uh, discussed okay so just uh, again when you get time just go through all these classes of this great tragedies and this will be interesting what i tried to do was to create to give you a kind of interest to embark a kind of interest in you on these four tragedies so that you can uh, learn more you can read more and it's really interesting if you could read bradley's analysis that will be really interesting more interesting okay so that is what all about the four great tragedies of <coughs> Shakespeare. <coughs> <coughs> <Sorry>. Okay. <coughs> We will uh, continue with Shakespeare's Roman plays now. So we have almost uh, towards the end of uh, Shakespeare's works because uh, we have discussed his early comedies, romantic comedies, uh, dark comedies, then histories. tragedies early tragedies um then um what to say uh, the great tragedies and uh, now shakespeare's roman plays this is how we have divided uh, his uh, <clears throat> what to say works now uh, we have uh, shakespeare's roman plays usually which are shakespeare's roman plays if such a question comes then usually we say it is julius caesar antony and cleopatra and coriolanus actually there is one more play that is titus andronicus the first tragedy by shakespeare titus andronicus is the first play by shakespeare first tragedy by shakespeare but why it is not included of course that is also kind of roman uh, play but why it is not included in shakespeare's roman plays is because that is set in mythical rome okay not the original rome or not from the original historical details of rome but it is set in the mythical rome uh, and there are other works by shakespeare which are set in mythical britain mythical rome and <clears throat> 
places like that and that is why that is not included if uh, such a doubt uh, uh, is aroused you can say like that uh, titus andronicus is not included among the roman plays of shakespeare because it is set in mythical rome not in the original but these three plays julius caesar antony and cleopatra and coriolanus these three are set in uh, rome and that's why we call it roman plays okay and uh, <clears throat> actually you can see that no significant plays or no important plays were written uh, on roman history uh, before uh, that of uh, before the time of shakespeare actually shakespeare started with this kind of uh, 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 genre and uh, after this you can see so many writers uh, have taken this uh, we have already discussed most of the works during that time were having sources so uh, the later writers also <clears throat> had sources from Roman history and they uh, wrote later. But before Shakespeare, uh, there were no significant plays. There can be some minor plays, of course, but no significant or popular or acknowledged plays were written uh, before Shakespeare on Roman history. Okay. And you can say all these plays, all the three plays are tragedies. Okay. All are tragedies and hence placed along with the <clears throat> tragedies in the first folio. Actually, I don't know whether you listened to the previous um, uh, classes, uh, the first folio, all these things we have discussed in very detailed way. Uh, that is like uh, Shakespeare's work, how it's, it got published for the first time and how many plays included, how the categorization happened. All these uh, are discussed in the previous classes. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> there is a section called the tragedies and these, uh, these particular tragedies were included in that uh, category. And then uh, you can say like this is based on, these works are based on where the source is from or which is the source of all these plays. It is based on Thomas North's English translations. <clears throat> English translation uh, from Amiot's French translation of Plutarch's Lives of Noble Greek and Romans. Okay, actually, Plutarch is the person who has written the works Lives of Noble Greeks and uh, uh, sorry, Romans. Okay, this is written in the first century AD. Plutarch wrote it in the first century AD. And there is a French version that is Amiot's French version, which came in 1559. And then again in 1579, there is an English translation for this particular work that is by Thomas North. And this is this particular version is the source for uh, Shakespeare <coughs> for writing all these works. Okay. And then uh, written at wide intervals as they are Roman plays. Don't think like, okay, they, they, uh, Shakespeare wrote all these plays uh, at a stretch or something like that. It's not like that. They all uh, got written at wide intervals. And of course, all the three plays are tragedies of politics. Actually, in the first classes, we have discussed the history of Greece as well as Rome. Hope you have listened to, to that and how Rome was and how, how Rome is divided into two, how Rome conquered England and all these details are <clears throat> we have already discussed. So uh, politics and uh, especially connecting to the Renaissance and how Roman people uh, were um, securing all these classical Greek as well as Roman uh, manuscripts and all those things, all these things we discussed. And um, uh, of course, politics has major importance uh, in the context of Rome. And that's why uh, Shakespeare's major works of Roman background are uh, basically of this uh, political background. And uh, they share some features of the English histories as well as tragedies. <clears throat> Okay, uh, it, 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 it has the traces of or features of English histories as well as tragedies. This is a combination of both. And I told you, Titus Andronicus, the first tragedy by Shakespeare is set in mythical Rome and so not included in this particular uh, category. 
Now, uh, let's just discuss uh, Julius Caesar. Actually, uh, I'm not going to tell the detailed plot of all these works uh, hereafter. Like, as, as those plays were the great tragedies, I just explained to them uh, content. Otherwise, it will be like, uh, you know, we will uh, scroll like anything. So, uh, Julius Caesar it got performed in 1599. And the theme of moral ambiguity in a political setting and resultant personal tragedy. You know the uh, uh, content of or the uh, context of or the uh, or the summary of Julius Caesar, I guess. And this written in between the histories and the great tragedy. See the year 1599. I used to say in my previous classes, if you know a particular detail about a particular work, with that detail you can guess and you can eliminate a lot of options and uh, you can come to the uh, conclusion like this can be the answer of this question so that is possible so uh, uh, if you know at least a detail of a particular work you can do such things so this particular work is written between histories and great tragedies because it got performed in 1519 soon after that you can see the great tragedies got written and soon before that you know the uh, history plays were written. So uh, while writing this Roman plays, especially Julius Caesar, Shakespeare has both these connections. Like uh, he has this hangover of history plays as well as he has, he might have uh, had the intention of this great tragedy. So in this particular play, we can see the elements of both history as well as tragedies uh, <laughs> because this resembles both and then, uh, like, for example, like in a tragedy, the protagonist aspires heroism and fails because of the moral shortcomings. The, the tragic hero concept can be uh, traced in many of these, uh, uh, you know, almost all these uh, works. Uh, and in uh, Julius Caesar specifically, okay, like in a tragedy, the protagonist aspired heroism, uh, but fails because of his moral shortcomings. And like in the histories, uh, you know, discussions of political philosophy, all such things, because this is an epaka uh, political uh, or historical or factual kind of a play. So, so many historical or political philosophical thoughts are uh, filled in this particular play. And then avoidance of civil disorder and violence as a higher moral obligation than a pursuit of power. That is also there. Avoidance of civil order and violence as a uh, higher moral obligation. It is the obligation to avoid this kind of uh, uh, things. That kind of a notion is also very well uh, maintained in this particular work. And I don't think there is a point of explaining the, the, the summary of uh, Julius Caesar. These are some, like, which are the Roman plays? Uh, and then what is the exact significance it 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 um, has or it resembles the features of both tragedy as well as history so these kinds of details and <clears throat> Uh, when you are preparing for an examination, you should go in detail. You should go for the uh, major characters, minor characters, uh, the place, uh, the um, uh, major incidents and all those uh, things. Okay. Uh, then uh, the first uh, <coughs> triumvirate, the second triumvirate and to which triumvirate Caesar belongs to and what happens, how Brutus got uh, manipulated by other people and the uh, significance of Mark Antony's speech. <clears throat> All these are the major uh, ideas that you should keep in your mind. And then comes Antony and Cleopatra. See, this is performed in 1607. Julius Caesar was in 1599 and this is in 1607. That's why I uh, told in the beginning that these plays got written on wide intervals. <clears throat> so Antony and Cleopatra is the <coughs> sorry. The basic conflict of the play is established in the opening scene itself. Okay, what is the problem? Actually, Antony and Cleopatra can be uh, considered to be, uh, or it is mostly connected with Julius Caesar. 
most of the characters are similar. Mark Antony, one of the prominent characters in Julius Caesar is again here in Antony and Cleopatra. And uh, this is like uh, soldierly duty as opposed to sexual involvement. That is the major theme or that is the major conflict that is discussed in Antony and Cleopatra. And this particular idea or this particular theme is established in the very beginning of the play itself. Okay. At first, Antony refuses to acknowledge the call of duty uh, represented by the messages from Rome. But when he learns about Pompey's revolt and the death of his wife, uh, Fulvia, he leaves Cleopatra with difficulty along with his loyal uh, general, <clears throat> Enobarbus. So this is how the play uh, goes. And finally, you can see how Cleopatra uh, manages the situation. Actually, they are losing the war uh, and how they are. With... Cleopatra is also one of the uh, prominent uh, female figures done by Shakespeare. And in later um, uh, times, uh, Cleopatra is actually reconstructed or deconstructed by many of the uh, critics. And uh, when it comes to Cleopatra, we all feel like, oh, the epitome of beauty. That is what the first thing comes to the mind of the people. Cleopatra, okay, uh, synonymously identified with beauty. But how brave a woman she was, how brave a, a, a fighter, a warrior, or a, a, a soldierly figure she was. So this kind of ideas are later analyzed in the case of uh, Antony and Cleopatra. <clears throat> okay, so that is one of the Roman plays by uh, William Shakespeare. So this is kind of <clears throat> almost during the similar time, the next year itself we got Coriolanus. Okay, Coriolanus, like the other uh, uh, Roman plays, individual versus history team. This was actually the theme of Coriolanus also, individual versus history. And Coriolanus is the title taken from Caius Martius, a, a, a famed Roman warrior whose excessive pride leads him to dishonor and to death. <clears throat> okay, that's, that, that's how this actually, this person's a title. The, the, this title is connected to Caius Martius. Uh, actually, he was so popular during that time, but because of his extraordinarily pride and uh, 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 you know this uh, he was so many so much of pr pride proud that he was a warrior he's a soldier and no one can beat me things like that and that's why that that is the significance of this title the name uh, Coriolanus <clears throat> Then uh, he is politically unsophisticated and emotionally immature. That is what actually the uh, the characteristic features or feature of Coriolanus: politically unsophisticated, uh, emotionally immature. That actually this is a creation entirely of his <coughs> mother, Volumnia, on whom he is psychologically dependent. Uh, actually, this is not exactly the characteristic feature that this person is having, but he is highly emotionally dependent on his mother, Volumnia. And it's Volumnia who gave this kind of a, uh, you know, difficult uh, uh, feature to Coriolanus. Politically, he is highly, politically, we should be sophisticated. Then only we can manage the different layers in a country. And also emotionally, we should be very much matured in the case of a, uh, uh, you know, ruler or a warrior or something like that. But Coriolanus was lacking both these, uh, the political sophistication as well as the emotional maturity. And that is what uh, leads to his, uh, you know, uh, failure or fall. Uh, so <clears throat> that is what about the all the three Roman plays of Shakespeare. Now let us see the final genre that is romances. Romances. His uh, final works, especially his uh, last work, is considered to be the Tempest, and the Tempest is considered to be a romance. And what is this romance? Which are the romances written by uh, Shakespeare? Let us see. Zimbeline, Pericles, The Winter's Tale, and The Tempest. Okay, these are the four plays which we categorize under the romances and one more thing you should keep in your mind though we though we categorize the plays under uh, this particular titles you know it has or the plays have 
uh, different features also. When we categorize Merchant of Venice under a particular category, it of course has the uh, the features of dark comedy, okay, and it it, it also has the features of tragic comedy, and. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and a problem play kind of a play that is of course later uh, our Ibsen and uh, other uh, George Bernard Shaw when they were writing this uh, problem plays during that time Merchant of Venice was one of the prominent examples given by the critics to be a problem play. Problem play means which discusses the contemporary issues. Uh, uh, during that time and that space and all those things. So Merchant of Venice was such a play. So uh, this is something you should keep in your mind. Though we categorize these plays under certain titles, you know, that doesn't mean exclusively this is a romance or exclusively this is a history play, exclusively this is a Roman play. It's not like that. Of course, these are Roman plays, but at the same time, they are, they are tragedies. Okay, so it <coughs> overlaps <coughs> sometimes. And then, uh, see, these are the romances. What is this romance? Let us just see. Romance means it's neither a comedy nor a tragedy. Okay, but at the same time, we cannot say it's tragic comedy. Of course, these are kind of tragic comedy things because there are elements of tragedies, there are elements of comedies. Uh, uh, in that way, it is like created. And then these are more serious and less sunny than romantic comedy. That is the difference between romantic comedy and romance. Okay, it's more see, in romantic comedy, there is nothing serious things. Mostly two lovers will be there and there, were, there will be so many problems in their love relationship. And finally, they, they, they'll get separated for a, a while. <clears throat> And somehow they overcome all these issues and finally they unite. This is what actually the uh, the, the, the features of uh, romantic comedy. We have discussed it in the previous classes. So, uh, but here you can see like the romances are more serious. That may be discussing more serious issues and less sunny. The romantic comedies are very sunny. Uh, we can just enjoy with a smile. Even if there are issues, we can enjoy with a smile. It's like that. But but romances are not like that. This is more grave, more serious, and uh, uh, less sunny than the romantic comedies. Both have love intrigues and happy ending. That is the similarity between uh, romances and romantic comedy. And then romances acknowledge evil and human sufferings, which we, which you cannot see in uh, what to say, romantic comedies. <clears throat> That means uh, the evil shades in the human nature and human sufferings, uh, according to which the humans, they have to undergo certain suffering. So all these will be there in the romances. And what is the difference between then tragedy? Unlike in tragedies, characters get second chances and can start afresh. There is no beginning and end. This is the uh, this is one of the important features of uh, romance as well as this is how we can distinguish a romance from a tragedy. Of course, this is very serious. Human suffering is there and all those problems are there. Then why can't we say this is a tragedy? We may sometimes ask. So this is the difference. In a tragedy, the person will not get a second chance. When King Lear banished Cordelia, he, he won't get a second chance. Okay, even if Cordelia comes back, he didn't. After stabbing Duncan, uh, though Macbeth is so confused, so lonely, <clears throat> he cannot bring back Macbeth. Sorry, Duncan. Okay, he cannot uh, uh, rewind and erase his fault. Same in the case of uh, Hamlet. Okay, he is uttering so many words against Ophelia, against his uh, 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 mother, and against the. Uh, so he is procrastinating the thing, but he is not getting a second chance for that. So all the tragedies, or in Othello also, this is the same. He is uh, sexually jealous. He is suspicious of his wife. He is not getting a second chance. But and, and in all the tragedies, other tragedies, not in the great tragedies, but all in the other tragedies also, this is what happens. But here, in romances, there is a chance of uh, a second chance. There is another opportunity for the people, the characters or the heroes or the heroines to rewind or revise their issues. Okay, that's how it, it is different. different. And uh, um, you can see like uh, the, uh, the features of uh, romances, let us see. 
perfection of the art of tragic comedy. Actually, tragic comedy is a genre and romance is actually uh, perfected this art of tragic comedy. That means both tragedy as well as comedy are there in this kind of works. And do you know who coined the term tragic comedy? It's not Shakespeare. Shakespeare has written plays uh, in the form of tragic comedies. Uh, but uh, this is actually simultaneously derived by Beaumont and Fletcher. Okay. Beaumont and Fletcher are uh, two writers who wrote mostly <clears throat> collaboratively. And uh, tragic comedy is a term coined by Fletcher, John Fletcher, F-L-E-T-C-H-E-R. John Fletcher is the person who coined the term tragic comedy in the preface to his play, The Faithful Shepherdess. Okay. Uh, actually, he has written a play, The Faithful Shepherds, Shepherdess. And uh, in the uh, preface to that play, John Fletcher is coining this particular term, term tragic comedy. Okay, this is something important. I forgot <clears throat> including it in the PPT. Uh, so please make a note of it. And uh, in uh, romances, you can say, uh, <clears throat> yeah, it is here. <clears throat> tragic comedy is the term coined by Fletcher is here. Uh, the <coughs> refers to his play, The Faithful Shepherdess. And you can see relaxed maturity, <coughs> mellowed maturity, and powerful creative touch. Okay, these are there in the romances. And style is easy and subdued. It's so not so complicated. It's a very easy style. It's a very subdued style. And wandering and separation of family members, uh, then uh, followed by redemption, forgiveness, reconciliation. These are the major features that we can see in most of the romances. Then sea and marine activity. When you go through all these uh, romances, you can see the elements of sea or marine activities, especially in Tempest and all. It's full of sea, <laughs> island, marine activities and all those things. And then, uh, you know, magic supernaturalism and other uh, fantastic element fantasy is very much included in romance so these are the features of romances when you analyze a play just imagine you are analyzing uh, the tempest as a romance okay then these are the features with which you should analyze you should understand or find out the, uh, the certain areas uh, which can be connected to these particular features and thus you can prove that okay the Tempest is a romance. And then uh, fantasy elements and mostly these are unrealistic. Okay, when fantasy comes, of course, these are unrealistic. Then Henry VIII, this is a history play. And Henry VIII uh, is written uh, almost during Henry VIII is the last play among his history plays. When, uh, when you listen to the history uh, plays class, you can uh, understand that Henry VIII is the last of his history plays. And this is actually written during the time when he was writing the romances. Okay, so you can see the characteristic features of romances is there in Henry VIII also. It is not a Pakka um, history play just like his earlier ones. But as it is written, and uh, when it comes to Shakespeare, you can say like, of course, his four tragedies are written in consequent years, but still most of his other genres, they are not written at a particular period of time or on a stretch. Uh, history plays. In the beginning of his career, he has written. In the middle of his career, he has written history plays. And towards the end of his career also, he has written history plays. And Henry VIII is such a play which he wrote during the time of uh, he was writing these romances and all these things. So the elements are reflecting in Henry VIII also. Then uh, you can say the uh, <coughs> appearance of appearance of pagan figures uh, similar to those in masks. Mask is another <coughs> type of drama uh, actually that is developed by Ben Johnson. Uh, 
and mask is like uh, you know uh, see uh, uh, it is like mostly the people the characters will be wearing masks that's why it is called masks okay and it has certain features also and here in romances this appearance of uh, some ball parties or dances and that kind of affairs and people with this mask and that kind of confusions these are actually the features of a mask so uh, uh, appearance of this pagan figures uh, and pagan figures is actually uh, very much visible or very much there in the masks so the same can be seen here in the romances also then uh, pastoral coupled with the uh, aristocratic uh, themes okay most prominently in windows tale and all you can see this combination of pastoral as well as aristocracy when a when a drama speaks something of the category of aristocracy or aristocratic people there won't be much uh, you know scope for a pastoral setting in that category but in uh, this particular uh, genre that is romance you can see a mixing up of pastoral and aristocracy uh, together then uh, influence of the genre mask i already told you then uh, the term romance so this is something very important the term romance was first used for the plays by edward dowden okay edward dowden is the person who acknowledged these plays to be romances like i told you tragic comedy is a term coined by fletcher likewise uh, these plays were categorized under romances and these plays can be called as romances because this is something different from romantic comedies this is something different from tragedies so this has certain unique features so this can be called romances likewise uh, uh, dowden has made this uh, structure of a romance in his work shakespeare a critical study of his mind and art <clears throat> okay it's an 1875 book shakespeare a critical study of his mind and art is a book uh, by by dowden edward dowden and in this particular work he is acknowledging or he is coining this particular term romance uh, and acknowledging these plays to be romances giving certain features okay uh, the tempest was included in the Uh, actually uh, uh, two noble kinsmen is a work considered to be written by shakespeare but in collaboration with someone else actually that is also having this kind of elements romantic elements and that is considered to be the last work but shakespeare individually exclusively shakespeare wrote uh, tempest okay that is in collaboration with someone else two noble kinsmen and that is why we acknowledge uh, the tempest to be the last work of shakespeare that is the individual work of shakespeare and last romance of shakespeare okay this was included in the wedding celebrations for the princess elizabeth and the elector uh, plantain in uh, 1630 so um, yeah that is the uh, uh, context in which uh, i i told I, i think when we start shakespeare uh, i just told you that just two or three plays are written for private <clears throat> uh, ceremonies or private purposes and uh, the tempest is one among them it is for a private purpose written that is for the marriage and just uh, let us just discuss the basic <coughs> details of all these work symbol line first symbol line this was performed in 1610 and this is set in mythical britain see i told you no uh, titus andronicus was set in mythical rome so just like that symbol line is uh, set in the mythical britain so you should uh, uh, remember this which of the plays by shakespeare is set in mythical britain if such a question comes you can write it as symbol line then cymbeline is listed uh, as a tragedy in the first folio i told you though it's a romance of course it can have the features of a, a tragedy because romances are mostly tragic comedy in nature tragic comedy means either it can be a tragedy with certain comic elements or it can be a very serious or grave play with a comic ending anything can happen in the case of uh, romances okay it's a tragic comedy piece 
So Cymbeline is actually having a tragic ending. So in the first folio, it was categorized under the tragedy because during that time, we don't have this kind of categorizations. And later, we consider Cymbeline to be a romance because it resembles most of the features <coughs> given to romances. Then uh, the, the plot of Cymbeline is partly from Boccaccio's Decameron. Uh, if you have listened to, to the previous audio, Boccaccio's Decameron is very important because that is the model for Geoffrey Chaucer to write Canterbury tales. Okay, so this is also this particular play is also uh, 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 partly. <clears throat> Uh, inspired by Boccaccio's G. Cameron and also partly by Raphael Hollinshed's Chronicles, not exclusively from De Cameron, but inspiration is from uh, there and here. Okay, the play is introduced by the ghost of John uh, uh, Gower as the enactment of an ancient tale. That is something, uh, another uh, information that you can keep in your mind, introduced by the ghost of John Gower. John Gower, do you remember? I don't know. Uh, we have discussed Gower earlier. He's a contemporary of uh, Geoffrey Chaucer. And um, uh, this play is actually introduced by the ghost of John Gower uh, and uh, like in the, in the form of an ancient tale or something like that. Very good. <clears throat> Pericles is in 1608, probably written with George Wilkins. We don't know exactly whether this is exclusively written by Shakespeare or by another, uh, you know, in a collaboration. So uh, this is probably written with uh, uh, George Wilkins. So uh, actually, this is printed in a debased text in 1609. It got performed in 1608 and uh, it got uh, printed in 1609. And the subtitle is The Prince of Tyre. This is also one of the questions which you know, keep on appear in many of the competitive examinations. Even I uh, had uh, this question in one of the exams. I don't re remember for my MA entrance or something like that. So what is the subtitle? Or the Prince of Tyre is the subtitle of which Shakespearean play? Or which play you can say? So uh, not all Shakespearean uh, plays uh, have this uh, uh, subtitles, only some. Uh, I have mentioned uh, almost all the plays with subtitles. So this is something very important. Pericles, the Prince of Tyre. Then it is set in Greece, which is the place the plays are set in. Uh, is there a subtitle? And if it is possible, the year of uh, performance and um, possible again, uh, source. These are something very important in the case of this kind of place. Then, uh, though uh, no fault of his own, Pericles is driven into exile and to become separated from both his wife, uh, Thiaza, and daughter Marina. So it's a very <coughs> tragic situation. And finally, they are re reunited with them at the place close. It's a happy ending. And the major theme of the play is that we cannot control our destiny. Okay, we cannot control our destiny. Our destiny is not in our hand. And the acceptance of suffering is human's only choice. That is the moral theme given by uh, this particular play. Okay, we have to suffer. We have to undergo all these kinds of things because it is destiny. It is not in our hand. Something like that. Uh, so that is what all about Pericles. Then comes the Winter's Tale in uh, 1610. Okay, Winter's Tale in uh, 1610. Uh, I, I told you, you know, the pastoral coupled with the aristocratic concepts that is there in the Winter's Tale. And uh, the first half of the play centers on the King <coughs> Leontus of Sicily. Sicily is the place, okay? And uh, uh, like Othello, he is also a person who is jealous of his wife, Hermione. Okay, it has some connections with Othello and having, <clears throat> because she has spent some time with the king of uh, uh, polyxenes of Bohemia and this creates some kind of confusions um, uh, on uh, King uh, Leontes and this leads to her apparent death, okay. So Hermione, uh, however, is not dead and um, uh, poses as her own uh, <clears throat> statue 
uh, seeing which Leontes uh, repents. Uh, like there is a statue of Hermione and whenever the king sees the statue, he repents his mistake. Oh, uh, I have done something like this and uh, something like that. Okay. Then resurrection is a common motive in the romances, especially in the case of romances, because people believe that to be, uh, uh, to be dead reappear. During that time, okay, people who died can reappear. They can come back. Uh, they'll be having an other, you know, waking up. So this kind of concepts and that is something uh, included in many of the romances during that time and even after Shakespeare. So this kind of a theme is here also. And second half of the play is a romantic comedy. Okay, the first half is kind of confusions, conflicts, a murder, and this resurrection and all those things like that. And second half is a, a romantic comedy, the love between uh, Perdita and uh, Florizel, another two characters. So it keeps changed to another, uh, it, it changed to another uh, aspect. And the play is closely modeled on Robert Greene's Pando's Tour. Okay, Pandosto is a work by Robert Greene. Uh, if you have listened to, again, the earlier uh, uh, works, Robert Greene is the person who fiercely criticized Shakespeare. Shakespeare, and he was saying like, um, what to say? Uh, Shakespeare is just like a crow who got the feathers of other uh, um, uh, birds and it is like <coughs> modeled and other, like <coughs> he's saying like, he is just coping from others and he is uh, assuming himself to be very talented or something like that. And he is a, a tiger in a sheep's uh, uh, camouflage to be something like that. And it is very deep. We have... Uh, made a very detailed analysis of Green's attack on uh, Shakespeare. And, um, uh, and it is uh, Robert Green's uh, Pandosto that um, uh, this play, The Window's Tale, is modeled. Okay, the model is almost with uh, Green's Pandosto. <clears throat> and we have Tempest. I don't uh, think we can uh, finish Tempest today. Uh, let us just discuss uh, what is it's just a stunning theatrical entertainment. Of course, this is written for a private uh, function uh, and it offers a mask like spectacle. Mask, I told you what was a mask and mask like spectacle. And the vision of virtues and vices is a complex as a uh, human um, um, uh, nature itself. Okay, that, that is what the uh, idea given by this particular play and uh, very little actual plot because it is full of fantasy it is full of that kind of thing so the actual plot is very little and the lack of suspense is complicated with bold theatrical effects then the role of providence in human affairs what is providence that is the protective power of god or nature okay god is protecting us nature is protecting us that is what called providence so role of providence in human affairs that is also one of the important ideas proposed by tempest don't worry we'll discuss tempest and uh, uh, we'll continue with shakespeare's sonnets tomorrow so by tomorrow we'll be winding up uh, 